right in there is where we would have our occult banquets. So what we do is we would load and unload right here. The car you just heard is a couple of the guys leaving. We're just all leaving now. We'd walk up there and the lines would be out the door. used to sit over here and talk about their banquets or their cult artifacts until it was moved into the banquet room. This side happened one time in this side. So the glass shelf just broke yeah. or fell? Did it, it did? Huh. Was everything on it? Oh yeah, and that one, uh, good thing that one uh, the empty glass and so just like, you know, uh, and that was a busy night, you know. Wow. <laughs> was it when Tony Sparrow was here? Exactly. It was? Yeah, it, it was. It was one time. And we were joking because he said, you know, the ghost is from over the next door, you know, and <laughs> make this, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's true, yeah. Happened was, a, I think it was a Friday or Saturday, I am not sure. Yeah, he usually yeah. did it on Fridays and Saturdays. Fridays, so. yeah. That's so I was working with uh, with my friend over there, Rav. Uh, the bald guy? Uh, yeah. The bald guy? Yeah. I remember, he's the young guy that's like... Yeah. Bob told him to stop looking at my butt. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bob had to tell him to stop. Stop looking at your... <laughs> Have you seen Bob? It's been a while, I didn't see him, yeah. No? Oh, Where's Bob, yeah. I miss Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, it looks like it's like just like a romance. Romance. I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I've wanted always. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, guys, Don't when you're tired, drink. you you need it, you know, drink and relax. Romance, Dracula. You know, Dracula <laughs> taking care of you, you know. What else do you need, that room? I can't live without Dracula. I know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're my favorite. If yeah. I, if Marty. Yes. Tell me the story of the shelf breaking again. Oh, the story that night was a uh, was a part of it there with uh, what's the what's the name of the occult banquet. Yes, occult banquet. There's a part with the ghost. Yes, the Annabelle yeah. doll and yeah. conjuring mirror. And a part of it there, and suddenly the shelf fell down, and it was like a busy night. So we realized how come and nobody touched it. So and after we realized because of the probably connected with the ghost. It was the same night as the banquet. Uh, yeah, same night. Oh my gosh. And it was top or second? Did you say it was the second? Yeah, it was this one and it was this one. Yeah, there was one there. I yeah, do remember there being one there. Yeah. Yeah. So it, probably something was with the magic or something, you know, has to do with the <laughs> Yeah, spirit. Well, they kept, they keep the Annabelle doll, the occult artifacts, 
conjuring mirror, stuff like that, they keep it all covered. Yep. Right there behind that wall. Yep. So, and did it shatter? Did the shelf shatter? Yep. Wow. Did anything happen after that? After that, you know, it's just like, um, we be like going like, you know, nuts because something you're gonna not organize and something, you know, it's just something not right, you know. That was unusual, like was before, you know. Shelf, make so many mistakes, almost like walking fell down, you know, something was like, Bad luck. Bad luck, you know. Really? See, yeah. you didn't tell me that part before. Yeah, I mean, probably I didn't have a chance to tell that one, but it was just something, you know, just... Really? Yeah. No, that makes and a lot all, more sense. Yeah. And all we remember that now, you know, yeah. Wow. Thank you, Artie. Oh, you're very welcome. I love you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hmm. To answer the question? Yeah. Oh, what? Are there normally nice, good answers and great questions? Well, I'm a large, I'll do a large, because I have to prove to myself that I'm not. Can you call on specific experiences or not? Because if I said, okay, I want to talk to my mother and my father, you know, what happens? This ugly looking artifact here. The next thing I want to show you, ladies and gentlemen, is the conjuring mirror. Ed said it was a magic mirror, and it is. It's a normal mirror. So during the occult banquet, I'm standing over at the small bar with little Linda. You can see her in the photo here. She works there. She's a sweet little cat lady. And I also know the owners of the restaurant as well. I'm standing with Timothy Dalton and sometimes the other folks that are on Tony Spare's team. So we're either standing at the bar or we're standing at the entrance. There's some sheriffs, nice guys, other people. So, during the unveiling of the Annabelle doll, something happened to me. Something hit me in the eye and it was a horrible burning and stinging sensation. I couldn't open my eyes. I had to take my contacts out and put my glasses on. Little Linda and Timothy were trying to help me. They also said it was really weird that that happened the second that Tony unveiled the Annabelle doll. And we were only like 10 feet from the doll. 
from the real Annabelle doll. And so this went on with my eye for a couple of hours. It was pretty bad. My eye got really swollen. It was really bad by the end of the night. You'll see in some of the photos and videos, like when I'm sitting next to Judy Sparrow Warren, Warren how my, I'm wearing my glasses and one of my eyes is pretty bad and all my makeup's rubbed off. It was awful. And they all thought it was really strange. Fatherly love for this, your servant, Roberto. Enlighten him in the goodness with the light of thine own understanding. Cleanse him and sanctify him. Give him true knowledge that made worthy of the grace of your baptism. May be endowed with unwavering sound judgment and a firm grasp of the holy doctrine, that he may have the power to fight all evil influences, whatever it might be. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of of our Holy Savior, in the name of the Blessed Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, come upon Roberto and save him from all evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael to help you in your battle. We call upon Padre Pio, who is powerful over every devil and demon, temptation and evil. Where did you want to go to? It said, I don't want to go. Through Padre Pio, the power of Jesus Christ, through Padre Pio, go back and never return. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to go back to where you came from. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we command you to leave, Roberto. In the name of Jesus Christ and all its holy. God the Savior commands you to leave Roberto. All these entities, leave now. We command you to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not I that command you, it's the name of Jesus Christ who commands you to leave. Go back to where you came from. Go back to hell. That's where you belong. Go there. Leave Roberto alone forever. Leave this family alone forever. Leave this house forever. In the name of Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ, the Virgin Mary and all the saints and all the angels, 
command you to leave right now and stay away from Roberto and never bother him again. Never. <laughs> Tell Christ you love him. Tell Christ, Christ loves you love him. You. Christ loves you, Roberto. He always has. And always will. You tell him you love him. Love him. Go ahead. Love him. There's no shame in that. Say that again. Something close to it. Call on Jesus Christ. Say Jesus Christ. Call on Jesus Christ. I cut that off there now. So that is just one of many cases that we endure, encounter. There are cases such as that. There are demonic entities, like I said. They are not very common, though. We don't get those every single day, but we do get them. And when you get them, you know, you have to deal with them. And when you deal with them, you have to deal with them with faith. No matter how strong you are, no matter how tough of a guy you think you are, you're never stronger than a demonic. Your faith, though, in God is more powerful. So you always have to remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Not to dabble, not to think you're getting away with it, not to play with a Ouija board. When Lorraine said she got most of her cases from the Ouija board, she actually is correct. We used to get seven out of 10 cases that came through. We'd ask, you know, did you ever dabble with the occult? And they'd say, well, we use a Ouija board. Or we went to a psychic reader, or we, went to a haunted house and wanted to see ghosts, you're inviting in the unknown realm. The Ouija board itself, ladies and gentlemen, is not dangerous in and of itself. Just like a, a gun, not dangerous. It's just a piece of metal, and it's how it's used. That's what's dangerous. It's how the board is used is what's dangerous. The communication with the unknown, when you put your hands on the Ouija board, on the planchette, and say, is there a spirit here? And they answer yes. You just invited in the unknown, invisible, intangible realm. If there's a spirit here, move something for me. Now you're asking them for a favor. When you ask the demonic for a favor, they want something in return, right? They want something from you. So it's not a game, per se, when you talk like that. So it's how you use things. It's always how you use the conduit to the other side. You don't want to dabble in that. If anyone here has used the Ouija board, I don't want you to be like super like paranoid and afraid now. Because you know, a lot of people have used it and nothing has happened to them. And I used to ask Ed that. Ed, how come like, you know, some people are affected and some people aren't in the supernatural and preternatural realm? And he's always used to say to me, well, you know, Tony, it's like crossing an interstate highway busy when it's very busy out. Some people try to run across and they make it to the other side. Other people try to make it and they're not so lucky, they get hit by a car. It's, that's how it is in the supernatural realm, you never know. Because like I said, they're attacking you on your weakest level if you have a bad aura, a weak aura, a chink in your aura. Your aura is the supernatural glow around your body that God has created in everyone. You wouldn't know if you have a chink. I could have multiple chinks for all I know. But you were born with a perfect one. That supernatural glow that emanates from everybody that God created that is alive. So the demonic will go for the weak link, the weak part of your aura. So if I were standing here with a perfect solid aura and the person next to me had a chink in it, the demonic's going to go towards the one with the chink in it. Just like if you're walking down the street and you, know, you're, you, and, a, you and an elderly lady are walking down two sides of the street. Who are they going to grab? The big tough guy or the elderly lady with a pocket bar? They're going to go for the weak person, just like demonic. That's what they do. But what I want... We have quite the turnout so far.
You got me a chair, Linda? What? Thank you. Good to see you. I know my, my forehead looks sh shiny, but hey, what can I say? You look beautiful. Thank you. you know you look, you're really glittery, by the way. I'm glittery. See, I'm a glittery. See all the guy. glitter scarlet that he has on his face? <laughs> <laughs> So this Annabelle doll banquet, occult banquet, was pretty intense. I didn't mean to meet the conjuring victims, but I did. It was about halfway through the banquet and everybody is up and walking around. It was after we all had dinner. Tony spoke. Everyone's kind of just relaxing and hanging out. And then all of a sudden, this couple, this elderly couple's in front of me, and I can't remember how we started talking, but I gave her a hug and I picked up and heard the angel say, psychically, that she was really sick and that it was to tell her it was going to be okay. So I started to give her the information. I still didn't know who she was and that her and her husband were the conjuring victims, but I told them. I asked her, I was like, are you ill? The surgery coming, it's going to be okay. She's like, who told you that? And I said, the angels here told me to tell you that. She's like, seriously, how did you know? Who told you? I was like, I am telling you the truth. She's like, nobody knows that, nobody. And I said, okay. And, um, you know, we got to talking and then... You know, the night went on, and there were lots of other folks to talk to. Well, later, Tony pulled me to the side, and he says, Amelia, who told you that? Nobody knows that except us. It's supposed to be a secret. And I said, I didn't tell anyone else. And I was like, Tony, who do you think told me? I was like, we've been talking for years. They, they told me. The angels told me. They're standing right here. And he's like, this is remarkable. He's like, do you know how special you are? He's like, I just can't believe this. And there were so many other things that happened as well. He even told the priest that I talked to angels, and it was just a, it was a long night. Another thing that happened was, I didn't know that at this banquet, I didn't know where the occult artifacts were from the Warren Museum. They had everything covered up in a certain part of the room. And I had no idea. And they didn't bring them out till later in the occult banquet anyways. So I walk by, I'm walking over to the little bar where I know that Linda and Artie and everybody else that works there and owns the place. So they always gave me free drinks, you know, espressos, things like that. And, um, as I'm walking to this tiny little bar, I pass the Annabelle doll, and I didn't know it was it. It was covered, and I hear a guttural, evil voice say, Emilia, said my name. And when I stopped to turn, I looked, and I saw this black mist around this covered-up, giant box-looking thing. I asked Tony about it, and he said, oh yeah, that's where, that's the Annabelle doll, that's the doll right there. We just keep it covered until, you know, the end valley. And stranger things had happened. Um, I had both of my recorders right here in my blouse. And I, um, um, after I left, I noticed that they were completely wiped out. They were they were completely full, 99 recording, recordings on each, and I had them just in case Tony wanted me to use them because we had been working on some sessions regarding the family, but that's a story for another time. Anyways, they were completely wiped out. All of the equipment in my truck was broken. My laptop was broken. I took it into... Uh, the Apple store, several other stores. Nobody could ever figure out why it was broken or what was wrong with it. I still have it to this day after all these years, and we still don't know why or what happened to it. A lot of strange things happened, too, in the hotel after that. And um, there were some weird occurrences later that night. And then... Um, some other strange things that happened.
What do you see, honey? What's in there? What are you doing? What are you looking at? Do you see something behind me? Yeah? What are you doing, baby? You are being so weird right now. Oh God, what are you looking at? What do you see? Whoa. I got chills. I don't like this. This is so bizarre. What are you doing, honey? Do we need to leave this room? Oh, I heard that too. What's really weird is on two separate occasions, two separate years, two different occult banquets, I go to the same hotel because it's right down the road. But both times, I get the same room. And it's the room, the creepiest one. And you know with hotels, there's usually a lot of suicides. They're always pretty haunted. It's another reason I usually stay in my truck. This night, though, was so intense that Luna and I wound up sleeping in my truck. Which I've never had to do before and I've been there many times. But I get the same room, which is on the back side, the dark side of the hotel. Kind of nothing but woods right there. It's really freaky and there's only three rooms on the back side. And it's a two-story hotel, which is just weird. It's uncanny really. So I get the same room again and I decided to do two live investigations in the room. And there were quite a few folks who witnessed the activity, the noises, the banging. I saw another black mist in the room go across the ceiling. And Luna started reacting as well to whatever went into the closet. And I was like, you know what, I'm done. I'm just, I need to rest. So I went and I grabbed Luna and we slept in my truck that night. It's a lot more comfortable anyways. I'll show those investigations one of these days. 
I mean, it was just bizarre. Even the other time with my eye, I mean, I had tears coming out of this eye all night. It was stinging. I had to take my contacts out. I had to put my glasses on. It was so bad. And um, there were just a lot of unusual things that had happened. Later, when I had taken pictures with the conjuring mirror, um, folks started to notice what could possibly be a manifestation of a face within the mirror, the conjuring mirror, the real conjuring mirror. Each occult banquet, I would visit and get to know the conjuring victims a little bit better. They had a lot of tears telling their stories. You know, I'd hold their hands and, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, I've been through this. It was pretty crazy, but there were a lot of fun times, too, during the banquets and um, a lot of different stories, and each banquet is a little bit different. And sometimes Tony and Judy would bring different objects from the Warren Museum, which it was only right up the road. There were a lot of unexplainable occurrences, uh, you know, regarding the paranormal activity. Hold on, we got a problem. The camera just shut off. It did? It appears like it did. The screen's black. This is exactly why, like, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm going to be showing this in the next one. Who knows if it's even still filming. Alright, let me see what's going on with it. Hey. Yes, is you ready for what? I said, I'm ready to go out to the museum, Ed, and stay there from 9 to 6, like he says, and you get 200 bucks. He says, look, and he puts his hand on my shoulder. He goes, I'm not going to let you get down there, kid. He's called me kid. I said, how come that? He goes, I like you too much, kid. That's why. He wouldn't let me do it. He, matter of fact, he wouldn't let anybody do it, no matter what. No matter anybody asked him, friends, relatives, good guys, cops, whoever they were, they, he wouldn't let them do it. Because he knew how dangerous it really is in there. There were times when Ed would go down there in the morning and everything would be tossed around like there's a big struggle or a fight down there. Things would be tipped over, the candelabras would be falling over, some of the statues would be knocked over. And Ed told me, so this the vibrations that build up in a small location like that with evil objects. Remember, these are objects that are not holy objects. These are things that were used by people in rituals and incantations. You know, when you go to a church and you get an object blessed, the priest is actually infusing that uh, artifact, that cross or that bracelet or that metal with good vibes, with holy vibrations. But when Satanists and people involved in black witchcraft do things to objects, they infuse it with the opposite. They infuse it with evil, evil intent, evil incantations. Evil is real. Evil is an entity. The, the devil is a real entity. It's not a mythical figure. It's not, a, it's not somebody's imagination. It's not a way to show you the opposite of heaven. It's a real place. Hell is a real place. But I don't think it's the place that we see in the movies where there's fire and brimstone. I think hell is more of a separation from God. Separation from your loved ones that might have gone to heaven. The eternal abyss, I call it. It's like an abyss of nothingness that you have to endure. You don't want to go there. You don't want to be that person. And you are being judged for every action you do and everything you do and the way you think. So when people say, why does that guy get away with that? Well, he might get away with something in life. But for eternity, you're going to be a lot better off than that, that person that is an evil person. I want to show you this one. This is short also. But I want to show you this because it features Lorraine. This is when Lorraine was well. She was probably 81 years old at this time, maybe. And she talks about demonology. She talks about possession. She talks about the occult. This is a Catholic program. This is a local Catholic uh, organization that filmed her and talking about the devil. So I want you to see this and, and listen to Lorraine and her thoughts on, on devils and demons. Queen All Saints Day, prime time for ghosts and ghouls and scary movies. 
But how close does fiction come to reality? For original ghost hunter Lorraine Warren, some stories are all too real. Soon after they moved in, it began. And it's something that comes at you and makes your heart speed up, that kind of thing. The Amityville case is a case that affected our personal lives more than any case we ever worked on. It was, it was a sad house. It was really sad. It was horrible. You know, you, you knew awful, awful things happened there. I said, I hope this is as close to hell as I'll ever get. Lorraine Warren and her late husband, Ed, together investigated thousands of cases. And although Ed passed away in 2005, Lorraine continues the work. Sometimes it can, it can be very exhausting, but very fulfilling. Lorraine is a clairvoyant, which means she can see, feel, and hear beyond the normal five senses. I didn't come to grips with it in its entirety until we met a Catholic priest who was ordained in Rome and studied paranormalology and demonology at the Pontifical University. He had psychic ability. He is the one that actually helped me to come to grips with who I am and my role where the Catholic Church is concerned. Born, raised, and a practicing Catholic, faith is very important to Lorraine. My faith plays such a very big role. My faith is my protection. My faith is my drive. My faith is what's allowing me at my age to continue and what, what I'm doing. Right there. Right here? Right there. Although Lorraine is not a demonologist as her husband Ed was, she continues to help people in trouble with things they can't explain. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to reveal your identity. When people just don't know what it is, they'll, they'll, they'll call me in. And sometimes they're human spirits that a blessing of the house, just a blessing of the house, will get rid of. But you know, when, when, when you talk to people and you go in and you walk around the house and you discern, you can tell where there's animosity, you can tell where there's been occult practices, you can tell where there's been drugs, alcohol. Those are the things that through what Lorraine calls the law of attraction, invites chaos and inhuman spirits into a home. Doors that are open, Ouija boards, play one of the biggest roles and still do today. But today we got more problems than ever before because of drugs. Going in to these homes and investigating the phenomena that was going on and documenting it, either through photographs or recordings or like that, that is the easiest part of the work. But how are you getting rid of it? I heard them, Father. I heard voices. Although Lorraine can discern and state that the house has a haunting phenomenon going on, she can't command it to leave. That has to be done by the clergy. We have worked with Buddhists, as I told you. We have worked with so many different religions. The hardest thing I find today is the fact that there are so many people. Their children aren't baptized. They don't go to church. There is no religion for them. And that is the hardest part of our work. Because faith and belief in God is the only real ammunition against the demonic. Where you go in to a very happy home, a very happy home. The kids are involved with their sports. They're involved in church activities. They're involved in all sorts of good stuff. Very seldom, very seldom. You may get a human spirit, you may get human spirit, but the real bad things come as the result of the doors that are opened by people. You're holding it down, aren't you? It's got that much strength to it. Uh, if you watch, you can see the little girl's legs 
are up on the rungs of the chair. She's not pushing herself up from the floor. The mother is not tipping that chair backwards. Nobody is touching that table. The table moves of its own volition. The Warrens have investigated thousands of hauntings through the decades, including the Amityville Horror, the Lindley Street Poltergeist, and the haunting in Connecticut. I don't have to convince the world that these things exist. I really don't feel I have to. You know, I can, I can explain to them what takes place and, and what can be done to rid the place. But, you know, you, you can't force people to believe in something that they've never experienced, and you hope they never do. Paranormal phenomenon, inhuman spirits, the demonic, things that shouldn't be taken lightly, says Lorraine. The key, don't open any doors. Reporting for Crossroads Magazine, I'm Stephanie Velikas. My name is Amelia Bussey. I am a demonologist, psychic, and paranormal investigator. I'm also an author. I wrote books in regards to paranormal investigating, training, safety, hazards, and concerns, as well as my very first book. which was about the devil house. Demonology is very different than demonolatry. Demonolatry is the worship of demons, while demonology is the study of demons. It's very important to know the difference. Demonology literature and text consist of long lists of demons by name accompanied by their characteristics and details of their religious origins. Origins of demons are rooted in various theologies and religions. I've been studying demonology and witchcraft, paranormal activity, you name it, since childhood because I had my first experiences from my earliest memories which I wrote about in my book. And it went even further back. My father and his several siblings were affected by demons as well. They were being choked, hurt, scratched, ca <clears throat> couches even levitating in the air, mirrors levitating across the room. The stories are endless and it traumatized them severely. I never thought that the same thing would happen to me throughout my entire life for over 30 years. The very in-depth nature of demonology has differed and expanded over the centuries. Traditionally, to become accredited demonologist, one would have to be sanctioned through the church. Modern demonology is a little bit different nowadays. Demonology teaches what demons are, origins of demons, sinister ways, possession, attachment, noticing diabolical presence, identifying demonic presence during seance or instrumental communication sessions. Demonic indications of the vessel is another very important factor with demonology. Precautions are very important as well when it comes to demonology. Demonic hauntings can spontaneously begin at any given time, anywhere. They're often like non-demonic hauntings to where they are slow, non-menacing. One set of phenomena that's exclusive to demonic hauntings is materialization. It's when something materializes out of thin air, such as maggots, flies, stones. It's been documented all over the world. I've documented the same. Demons have what's known as telepathy. They can read people's minds to uncover their weaknesses, vulnerabilities, stress, anything that they can use against them to eventually lead to aggression, oppre um, oppressive activity known as oppression, infestation, and so forth. 
The most profound visual evidence that I ever captured was that of a demon. A manifested, <clears throat> a demon that manifested directly in front of me. It looks just like a textbook demon. I'll never forget it. It was on the house that I built. I built a house on a ranch in Texas and the activity there was so severe. A neighbor ranch across from mine, they had two children. One was a toddler. He was drug out of his bed down the hallway by an unseen force. Later down the road was when I captured the photo of the demon and there was a lot of other things that happened during that time. There are six types of hauntings. Diabolical, um, demonic attachment, poltergeist hauntings, intelligent hauntings, residual and animal hauntings. This is the occult museum, perhaps the most haunted area, I would consider the most haunted area in the world. Over 45 years of collections of voodoo dolls, occult practice objects, satanic ritual objects, witchcraft objects. Or show itself. It doesn't have to do it when you ask. It's not at your beck and call. So when you say, like that young man said, if that doll can do anything to me, put slashes on me right now. That's what he did. And Ed looked at him and said, son, you and your girlfriend, get out of here. I just got through telling you, don't touch anything, don't challenge anything, and you had to do that, get out. Now the kid was smirking on the way out, making snarky remarks to everybody who was still uh, listening to Ed. And he didn't make it home. He drove on the motorcycle with his girlfriend, and they were laughing and joking about the doubt, says the girlfriend. Monroe, Connecticut. This idyllic New England town is home to a bizarre collection of artifacts that are not for the faint of heart. This is the Warren's Occult Museum. I would describe this museum as probably the most haunted location I'd say on Earth because... Halloween. Trick or treat. Pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns, chocolates and candy corn, kids having fun. That's one side of Halloween. But there is another side. All Hallow's Eve, the night when the dead become restless and their spirits walk among us. Scared. Not me. For the next hour, we're going to celebrate this other side of Halloween, this dark side with some people who've been there before. People who know it, who respect it, and who believe in it. Halloween. Tonight, a couple who fight demons. We got a lot of emails even today, especially after people watching the movie. Is, is Judy as gifted as Lorraine? Well, she's not as gifted because she didn't go on cases like Lorraine did. The more you experience the paranormal realm, the more you become sensitive to things like Lorraine did. She went on literally thousands of cases. To develop anything, you have to get training in it. You know, a, a police officer, he gets a he gets like a sensitivity towards things. He gets like an awareness of things around him. That comes with experience. Same thing in the paranormal. Same thing in psychic ability. The more you're around it, the more you develop your senses. But Judy is afraid of it. She is afraid of the paranormal realm. And the reason she's afraid is Ed used to tell her stories when she was young. It scared the living daylights out of her. So even today, tonight, when we go to bed tonight, She'll do a ritual that is kind of, I don't know, I mean, she does a ritual with holy water, she does a ritual with blessings. She envisions herself in a white light around her. She prays to God and to saints to protect her from anything evil or demonic. And she looks over at me and she says, especially you. <laughs> that, 
and then, and then she goes to sleep. But the thing is, she is afraid. She's afraid of the dark. She's afraid of the dark. And it's because of the stories that I used to tell. She has the ability, but she wants nothing to do with investigating the paranormal realm. But Ed and Lorraine, though, Ed especially, because he grew up in a haunted home between the ages of five years old and 12. Ed was so frightened of that haunted house in Bridgeport that he would wait outside for lights to go on in the house when he came home from school. And I'm talking seven, eight years old. It'd be freezing cold in February. He'd come home. He'd look, you see, it's dark. He would hide. Ed would actually hide underneath the vegetable carts that the, the Italian men used to have when they sold their fruits and vegetables out there. He would hide underneath the abandoned carts in the wintertime, waiting for a light to go on. When the light came on and Ed knew someone was home, he'd go in. That's how frightened Ed Warren was. And his twin sister, Babe, same thing. They experienced haunting phenomena in that house that was so frightening to them that when Ed was 16 years old, I'm sorry, 17, he joined the Navy on his 17th birthday, he said to Lorraine, when I get out, I'm going to find out if other people have had the same kind of experiences as I had growing up in that house in Bridgeport. <clears throat> Lorraine, who was psychic even then, at age nine she was psychic, said to Ed, Ed, you must be reading a lot of different books. All you people are reading books. There aren't no such thing as ghosts and devils and demons. And it's a, Lorraine, you're saying that because you never lived in a haunted house like I did. I'm going to show you. So when he got out of the Navy, he went to art school for two years. Now Ed was kind of a young, cocky guy, you know. He was in World War II. He saw a lot of stuff. He comes back. He grew up in the bad streets of Bridgeport. He says to Lorraine, after two years at art school, he comes home one day. He says, Lorraine, guess what? I quit art school. She says, what are you talking about? You quit art school. He says, I can paint better than the instructors. That's how cocky he was. He goes, I'm going to start painting, and we're going to sell our paintings. And they did. He would get these little pieces of barn wood, and he'd do a, a, a drawing of a house or a New England scene. And he called them barn door paintings because they looked like little barn doors. And he would drive up to Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and he'd sit with his 1933 Chevy sedan, he'd park it, put a seat out with an easel, and the paintings out. So I said, Ed, you really made money doing that back then? And Ed laughed. He goes, oh, yeah, kid. He's calling me kid all the time. I said, yeah, kid, I made an exorbitant amount of dough. I said, Ed, what'd you make? Five, six hundred bucks a piece? What? What'd you make? He goes, I made a lot of money. I said, well, tell me. He said, I made five, six dollars a piece. I laughed. I said, come on, Ed, five dollars for a painting? Ed said to me, kid, you've got to remember, it was 1950, 51. We, Lorraine and I used to stay in a cabin up in Vermont for a dollar a night. I used to buy gas for 28 cents a gallon. We'd buy a hot dog for a dime. He said, so if I sold four or five paintings and I had 25 bucks, I had a lot of money. I was bucks up, you know? So that's how he started painting scenes and selling them. But then, he used to read these articles in Fate Magazine about haunted houses. He'd go find the house that he read about. He'd drive up to the house in his 1933 Chevy with Lorraine at age 20, 21, 22. He'd park in front of the house. For instance, like the Henniker, New Hampshire house, the Oceanborn Mary house. He would, a house like that, he would read about it. He'd sketch it on a pad with a pencil and a pad take him about 25 minutes to do a nice drawing of the house. He'd hand it to Lorraine and say, Lorraine, go up there and knock on the door. Whoever answers that door, tell them that your husband out in the car there had, did a nice drawing of your house he wants you to have. <clears throat> Maybe that'll get us in. And I can talk to the people about the haunting. And that's what they would do. Lorraine would walk up, and moments later, you'd see Lorraine beckoning to Ed to come on up. They want to talk to you, Ed. And Ed would go in, talk about them and their house and the phenomena that would occur. That's how it all started back then, back in the early 50s. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little. I want you to see them now, well, about 20 years ago, doing an actual investigation. Did you give them the, uh, it's called, uh, it's a Halloween special we did back in 1993. And it shows Ed and Lorraine actually going on a real case in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. 
And Linda, if you're there or somebody, can we lower the lights a little bit and turn up the volume on the case? Maybe it depends on how I feel. I might I might raffle off that Annabelle poster to someone. They gave us a couple of them. Warner Brothers came here and showed us the uh, screening of the movie. Thank you. 
My name is William. I have known Emilia for close to 20 years now. Um, I have been a strong skeptic for the majority of my life. Uh, through the time that I've spent with Emilia, I mean, through being there, watching her doing sessions, hearing, you know, not being able to hear the EVPs, obviously, not being able to hear when they're being recorded, hearing, but hearing Amelia kind of make statements that don't really make sense until you listen to the EVPs, and it's quite clear that she is able to hear these voices um, because she's responding to them and <laughs> asking questions that from my perspective, like don't make any sense because obviously I can't I can't hear what she hears. You hear the conversations, the EVPs, and then her uh, responding to them. You know, it's obvious that she's able to hear something that is completely outside of my senses. I, I you know, I, it's it just kind of amazes me. And I'm standing there, and we are in an absolute quiet room, um, so I know there are no other sounds that can accidentally be heard as a voice or anything else. Um, to hear it played back on the EVPs and hear these clear, distinct voices, uh, not just saying words, but, you know, multiple words, sentences, um, that, like I said, Amelia is, is just picking up on. Um, and then there's, there's other times where, you know, literally seconds before an event will happen, Amelia would tell me, I think this is about to happen, and literally without fail that exact thing happens I remember we were traveling on a on a trip to Colorado and uh, we had these little uh, walkie-talkies that we were talking back and forth with and she came over the walkie-talkie and said she thinks that the tire is gonna blow and I was looking at it and I'm like your tire is fine and then again literally seconds after that uh, the left tire on the back of the trailer uh, blows out and you know we had to pull over and, and fix that but there's just so many instances of that mixed with the EVPs that she gets. Um, I've been present when she talks with other people and does readings. Uh, and just to hear like the responses from these people, they're just so amazed and kindly taken back uh, by what Amelia is telling them. Like objects that are in her house that you can't, <laughs> that, that there's no way that Amelia's never been there. Uh, you can't see them when she's doing like the uh, video conferencing with them and she's she's talking about objects uh, in their house and what happens with those objects. Um, it's just, you know, case after case of things that are just absolutely unexplainable and, you know, clear to me that it's, it's, I don't know, I can't explain it. It's something supernatural, something otherworldly. You know, that's the only... This is the only words I can use to describe it. And in all of those 20 years, I've never seen Emilia walk away uh, from a case or even hesitate uh, to take on a case uh, to help other people, even when she's completely just already, to me, seems like she just has a never-ending, overloaded workflow. Um, people will ask for help, and she will carve out the time to do that. And it's just, uh, it's amazing. There are countless nights where I will find Emilia, you know, asleep at her desk uh, or laying in bed with uh, her laptop or paperwork or case files next to her that she's been going through. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's really inspiring the amount of effort and passion and compassion that she has for the people that she's helping. and not only the living but on the other side you know she cares just as much about moving the people on the other side of the veil 
on to their final destination as she is as, as helping the uh, the living people who are you know scared or feeling some kind of adverse effects uh, from you know supernatural presences in the house um, and not only that uh, you know she's constantly talking about just you know people in their their lives how they're doing in their lives it's not all about hey tell me about what supernaturally happened it's like hey how did your week go how did your day go um, how's your brother doing you know we talked about last time you, you were having problems with your brother how's he doing she fully commits herself to helping people and it's just all in I and mean, there's no there's no gray area it's 100 percent all the time and and this is no joke to Amelia she takes this very seriously because sometimes it's not just uh, you know ghosts that she's coming up against sometimes these people have you know actual demonic infestations in their home um, which is just unbelievably scary I mean it's a whole nother level of, of you know trying to help people it's not just something that's so easy uh, to move on and it's just to, to hear the destruction that it does in these people's lives and to have Amelia there constantly uh, on phone calls, on video conferences, uh, talking through chat, email, you know, every form of communication, she is going back and forth with these people. And even during those times when there, you know, there is a demonic infestation, I've never seen Amelia scared uh, or hesitate in any way. And she's literally taking these adult men and women, uh, you know, taking them in her arms, you know, they're crying, holding their children, helping them, telling them that it's going to be okay, you know, making sure that they know that she is not going to stop or leave them out in the cold until a resolution is found. Um, she's going to, you know, go the distance, stay there with them, help them any way she can. You know, whether it's driving across the country multiple times to come to the house. I mean, honestly, it, it blows my mind uh, what this woman goes through, uh, you know, what Amelia goes through. Uh, and I respect Amelia more than anybody in this world. She has proven herself time and time again to be, like I said, compassionate loyal um, and just one of the souls that you don't come across maybe but once in a lifetime someone's just that's just so open and leads with their heart and is just loving to a fault well at least somebody put their pants on for this interview <laughs> now it's pretty serious what I do and I definitely am glad that I have you by my side because it gets pretty lonely and people are pretty mean in the world about all these things and I've been really discreet my whole life about it I mean it took a long time just to get you to accept the truth even when it was happening right in front of you and everybody's kind of like that at first I'm this has been my life since my first memories it's insane you know, there's all these rituals involved, you know, I'm not a religious zealot or anything like that. It was the other side that actually taught me about God and Jesus and angels and what was incorrect in the Bible and what was correct and how to fight demons. It's just, I have a lot that I'm going to be teaching the world. Yeah. Yeah. You just, do, you just you do it with so much love, though. I mean, you see a lot of other... I really do care. Yeah, I mean, you show just so much love for the people. It's uh, watching you do what you do. It's it's different than you know, looking at anybody else. I mean, obviously you can't trust what's on TV, but I mean, you just. I know. I turned them down and their contracts. I still have the emails of them saying they wanted to put voices over my work and over me, and I said, hell no, I'm not going to do this. Stay away from me. And they're like, what can we do to convince you? If they wanted to give me all this money, I said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing the show. Yeah, I've never seen you once ask for money. I've seen you spend, never. <laughs> spend an infinite I've amount spent more. Spend over half a million. Than you've ever, I mean, you've never asked for a dime from anybody. Yeah, but I'm broke. 
<laughs> I find a way. I, I trust. I trust the light to help me. The angels always take care of me. They do. And God. So. I think yeah. They always lead you to people in need. Mm-hmm. But they also, you know, they always told me never to give up and fight back. And, you know, gave me, brought me the answers that I asked for and said there was a destiny and a purpose with this. And there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say, though, you know, I'm always giving criticism because you learn from it. But you are the worst camera operator sometimes. <laughs> That's why I don't put camera operator on my resume. <laughs> <laughs>